a time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. God and Father, as we listen to your word this morning, please remove our unbelief, confusion, and disobedience. Help us to encourage one another so that none of us is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Please produce in us the fruit of your spirit. Amen. Today's reading is James 4, 13 to 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city, and we will stay there for a year and do business and make money. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are like the mist which appears for a while and then disappears. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord is willing, we will leave and also do this or do that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, the person who knows the right thing to do but doesn't do it, this person is guilty of evil. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you're visiting today, uh, and I haven't met you, my name is Omar. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoy your time with us today. Uh, now, you've come just in time as we work our way through this letter of James. It's a very practical letter. And uh, today we're looking, as you can see on the screen there, uh, it's a word specifically to the middle class. It's a word to the middle class uh, Christians. And uh, as most of us are middle class, it's a word to us. So how about we begin by praying? Father, we thank you that your word uh, never returns to you empty-handed, but it always uh, accomplishes the plans you have for your word. And so we thank you for today, this word from James, uh, this word to us about how to live our lives in this world with Jesus and we pray that you will help us to take these words to heart so that they sit there and do their work in us and we ask this in Jesus' name, Amen. Our friends, in uh, Roman society 2,000 years ago, there were three main groups of people. The first group, thank you Roy, was this, it was the poor and this was far, by far the, the largest group of people in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. And this large group was mainly made of uneducated farm workers and day labourers. And really what these people did was they got up very early in the morning every single day and they worked really hard all day. And then when the sun was finally going down at the end of the day, that's when these people would get paid for their day's labour. And this group of people, poor people, may remind you of some of the stories that Jesus talked about. You know, he told that story of the, the rich landowner who would go to the marketplace every day looking for people, workers, to work in his vineyard. Well, the people he was looking to hire were the poor people. You see, Jesus was actually describing real people. And for these real people, as long as they kept working, then they and their families could, could keep eating. Which, of course, meant no work, no money. No money, no food. And in the first few centuries of the growing Christian you know, church in the Roman uh, Empire, the largest group of Christians came from this group of people the poor people who were very attracted to the teaching of Jesus and the love and the power they found and experienced in the Christian church. Now, the second group of people, thank you, Roy, in the Roman Empire was a much smaller group of people. It was the middle class. These people were the merchants, or as we might say today, they were the business people. 
These people were educated, they had money, mainly through their family connections. And so through the money they had, they could trade and, and do things and really use their money to make more money. And it was these middle class people who were climbing the social ladder in ancient Rome. And in the early days of the Christian church, there weren't really that many people from this group in church. There weren't that many Christians who came from this group of people. But there were some. And if you read the New Testament, you meet actually some of these middle-class people. One of them was, uh, you'll find in the book of Acts, where Paul goes, I think he's in Philippi, the city of Philippi, he goes down to the river and he meets a woman called Lydia. And Lydia is a very resourceful woman. You know, this is 2,000 years ago. A very resourceful woman and she's buying and selling purple cloth, which makes her a business woman 2,000 years ago. She was part of the middle class some of whom joined the church. Now, the third group of people, thank you, Roy, in Roman society was a very, very, you know, small group of people in Rome, but they were very rich. They had most of the money. And a lot of these guys, they were the, the landowners who owned all the land. And surprise, surprise, these guys were the people who hired the poor people to work on their farms. And because 2,000 years ago you didn't have any unions or, you know, sort of industrial relations legislation to protect people, often these richer landowners treated the workers very, very poorly. And in the early days of the growing uh, Christian church, there were hardly any of these people in the church. Now, there were some but not many. And again, when you read the New Testament, you come across really interesting bits of information. Like this one, thank you, Roy. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to Christians in the city called Corinth. Corinth is a really big sort of business centre 2,000 years ago. And listen to what he says to these Christians. He says, brothers and sisters, think of uh, what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. So there you have it, friends. Even in a very rich city like Corinth, how many people in church were rich and powerful and influential and famous? The answer, not many. Now, friends, here at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, James writes to each of these groups of people. Well, he doesn't actually write to each of these groups of people, but he does write about them. Now, let me explain what I mean. Thank you, Roy. What I mean is that, firstly, James writes to the poor people who are Christians in church. And he does that, as you can see there, James chapter 5, verse 7 to 11. Secondly, thank you, Roy, James also writes to the middle class Christians who are in church. And you'll find that in James chapter 4, verse 13 to 17. But thirdly, thanks you, Roy, he writes to the poor and the middle-class Christians about the rich. He doesn't write to the rich who are in church because there aren't many. But he writes about the rich who are outside the church, many of whom are persecuting and mistreating the people inside the church. And that's in James chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. Now, over the next three weeks, we're going to look at what James says to each of these groups. And this morning, we are going to look at what James says to the middle group, the ones who are 
the business people, the middle class, the ones who were busy climbing the social ladder. And so, friends, this is God's word to the middle class Christians. Listen to what uh, he says. Thank you, Roy. This is what James says. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will travel to a such and such a city and we will stay there for a year and do business and make money. Now, friends, James says that 2,000 years ago, the middle class followers of Jesus have a problem. You see, James says that what these people are saying is wrong. And what they're saying is something like, you know, they're in church talking to people over morning tea and they say, oh, my, you know, me and my business partners, we're going to go down to Rome for, you know, just for a while, a year or two. We're going to Corinth and then we're going to go to Athens and we're going to do a bit of business and we're going to make money. You know, whatever we feel like. Now, friends, for us modern people, this doesn't really sound all that bad, does it? You know, in our modern world today, there are many opportunities for us to invent new things, create new services that help people, you know, live their lives. So business like that is not unusual for us. And often in business today, people have to travel So, friends, what's the problem, James? What is it you're not happy about, James? What are the middle-class Christians doing wrong? Well, the truth is that James is not really worried about what the uh, middle-class Christians are saying. He's not really worried about the words that come out of their mouths. Instead, he is more concerned about the heart that produces these words. You see, just like his older brother Jesus, James knows that all our words come from deep within us. And it is that that James is worried about in these middle-class Christians. So, for example, look at these verses, Roy. This is Jesus describing what James is talking about. Jesus says, A good person brings good out of the treasure of good things that are stored in his heart. A bad person brings bad things out of the bad treasure that is in his heart. Because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, friends, that is what James is really worried about with these middle-class Christians because he is looking at what lives inside of the hearts of these people. And what he can see these middle-class Christians have a lot of in their heart, what he knows, you know, their hearts are so full of that it just comes out in the words that they use. What he knows that these people have overflowing in their heart is arrogance. And that is what makes James very, very concerned. He hears their words and he can see the arrogance in their heart. Look at what James says. Thank you, Roy. This is verse 16. He puts it like this. He says, But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Friends, James says these middle class Christian people are arrogant. They are proud. They think they are better than other people. They think they know more than other people. And to top it all off, they boast in their arrogance. Now, friends, how does this happen to the followers of Jesus? You know, how do sincere followers of Jesus become proud and arrogant 
and boastful. How does that happen? Well, these people were the middle class of ancient Rome. They had money. And that's the danger of money. That is the power that money can have over you, over me, over anyone. But friends, if you think about it, it's not really the money that's the problem. I mean, money is just a piece of paper, a number in a bank account. You know, that's not really the problem. No, money really isn't the problem. But just like the Apostle Paul taught his young student Timothy, do you remember what Paul said to Timothy about money? He said, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all different kinds of evil. Evil like arrogance and boasting. And that is what these middle class Christian people 2,000 years ago were. And James says, you know, their boasting is evil. Now, friends, money's not really the problem. Because actually the truth is the more money you have, the more good you can do in this world. Because money gives you power. Power to do good, power to do evil. So money really isn't the problem. It's the love of money that's a problem even for the followers of Jesus. And friends, I hope you can see that these 2,000-year-old words to a group, you know, a small group of Christian believers who were middle class in the church 2,000 years ago, I hope you can see these words so old, written for people back then, these are still God's words to the Christian middle class today. And really, I think for us living in Australia, these words are probably more important to us than they were to them back then. Because just think about it. Here in Sydney, all the followers of Jesus, most of the followers of Jesus are middle-class people. Now, not all, of course, but many, if not all, the followers of Jesus in Sydney are middle class. You know, they have a good education, they live in good suburbs, they own their home, they make good money. And so most of them, most of us, we too are in danger of becoming arrogant, proud thinking that we're better than other people, thinking we know more than others, and being boastful in all of that. So, friends, what's the solution? Get rid of all your money? Never start a business? Is that the solution? Well, James actually has some Helpful words to say here to the middle-class Christians living 2,000 years ago. And the first thing he says, thank you, Roy, is this. He says, look, instead of speaking the way you do, maybe you ought to say, if the Lord is willing, we will live and also do this and do that. Well, that could help, I guess. You know, at the start of your sentence, Put the, if the Lord is willing. And if you forget to do it at the start of the sentence, maybe you can put it at the end of the sentence. Just tack it on. If the Lord is willing. And then everything's okay. God's happy. And you can keep being the person you are in your heart, making money, being boastful, being proud. Now, do you think doing that would help us in our battle 
against arrogance and being boastful? Do you think it would really help do that? Well, as you can probably guess, James is not really saying just say these words and everything will be all right. James isn't just saying, look, just don't change your heart and just tack on these words at the beginning or tack them on at the end and then God will be happy. You don't need to change. You can just do what you're doing. Is that what James is saying? Well, no, of course not. He is not saying just throw those words in. But incredibly, that is what many Christians believe. They do. That's how they behave. They think, oh, if I just use the right words, if the Lord is willing. If I just say the right thing or do a certain action, then it will be okay. You know, poof, just like magic, no problem. But if we do think like that, that's a really big problem. You see, if we sincerely believe that just saying the right words or just doing the right actions will fix it, if we sincerely believe that, then we are being superstitious. Because that's what superstitious people do. Superstitious people believe if you just say the right words or maybe do the right action, then it's all okay and you will get what you want. And really that is just superstition. And if a Christian people do, does it by using special words, it's still superstition. It's just Christian superstition. Now, friends, treating God like this superstitiously is a very dangerous thing. And if you want to see an example of what can happen to you when you treat God superstitiously, listen to this story. Thank you, Roy. This is from Acts chapter 19, one of my favourite stories. Listen to what these guys do and what happens to them. It's a story about the seven sons of Sceva. Imagine having seven sons. And look at what happens to them. Luke writes this. He says, look, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches... I command you to come out. Now, seven sons of Sceva, who was a Jewish chief priest, they were doing this. But one day, the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and gave them all such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, friends, I think these seven sons of Sceva, they learned their lesson the hard way. Friends, it's not about the words you use. It's not about saying the right words. It's really all about having the right heart. That's what it's about. It's about having the same heart that Jesus had. It's about having the same heart that the Apostle Paul had. And if you have that heart, then your words will be right, whatever words you use. And so, how do we get the right heart? Well, I'm glad you asked, because James has some very good advice on how to get the right heart. Listen to these words. Thank you, Roy. He says this, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. 
You are like mist, which appears for a little while and then disappears. So you ought to say, if the Lord is willing, we will live and we will also do this or do that. And friends, that's how you get the right heart. You get the right heart by remembering that today could be the last day of your life here on earth. You get the right heart by sitting down occasionally and thinking about, you know, the mist that settles so thickly on the ground in the morning, but then as soon as the sun starts to shine, that mist disappears. And then when you realise our lives are like that, you will have the right heart. You see, friends, we are here today, gone tomorrow. Or more accurately, we are here today, gone by lunchtime. That's what our life is. And when we have that truth in our heart, we will become deeply humble people who really do know that everything in our lives depends on God's will. It all depends on the Lord. And friends, did you notice how James finishes that sentence? He says, if the Lord is willing, we will live. Now, that's pretty basic, isn't it? If the Lord is willing, we'll live. And then maybe we'll do something else. But that's the truth. That's how fundamental and basic it is. Every moment we have, every heartbeat, every breath, it all comes from the hand of the Lord if he wills. And when we learn that, When we have that in our heart, we will live our lives well. We will avoid a lot of evil, like boasting and arrogance. It won't even happen. And we will then live for the glory of the name of Jesus. And guess what? That is the Lord's will for us to live for the glory of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you show us how to live with your son. And thank you that we need to just let go of so much secret arrogance and boasting that we have in our heart. Help us, Lord, to return back to basics Every heartbeat, every breath, every moment is from your good hand. Help us to start there and to so be enamoured with Jesus that we live increasingly for him. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Okay, thank you, Roy. There's uh, one question there. Firstly, the, the phrase that James talks about, you know, they're only words, but they're very helpful words. Uh, if the Lord is willing. Now, with the people around you, you know, you have five minutes, talk to them about, you know, what these words mean to you. What do they mean? What could they mean? How could they help us? If the Lord is willing, you have five minutes. Enjoy. As we pray together, I invite you to say the final line together at the end of each section. Lord, have mercy on us. Let's pray. Our sovereign Lord and Father, we come to you this morning knowing that we have trusted in our own abilities, in our own strength, and in our own intelligence instead of trusting you. Lord, have mercy on us. Father, we confess we have set our hearts on the temporary pleasures of this world and that we have valued possessions and the praise of other people more than we value your approval. Lord, have mercy on us. 
Lord, we confess that we have doubted your goodness and that we have grown resentful and bitter when life becomes difficult. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, we confess that we have not followed the examples of Jesus who served the sick and the suffering and who had compassion on all people. Lord, have mercy on us. Father, we confess that we have been hard-hearted and judgmental towards, each, towards others and that we have considered ourselves better than the people you have graciously placed in our lives. Lord, have mercy on us. Father, we confess that we have let greed and envy and pride live in our hearts and that we have neglected prayer and thankfulness and praise. Lord, have mercy on us. Father, please help us to be patient in whatever situation we are in today, whether we are single or married to a difficult spouse or parenting rebellious children or caring for elderly parents or suffering through sickness or disease. Please help us to remember that although not all things are good, you promise to work in all things for the good of those that love you. Lord, have mercy on us. Father, we thank you that your abundant forgiveness and grace is available to all people through your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again, and who now rules over all things, and who pours out your Spirit on all peoples, from all tribes and nations and tongues, on whoever will call upon your name. Lord, we thank you for all these things in his glorious name. Amen.